Hello, this is Pritish Sanyal and this is the 1% Project Podcast. The format of this podcast is I interview some of the smartest minds about their career and life. But these mini episodes are different. They are based on the research I do for the 1% Project Conversations. Prep for every guest conversation leads me into some fascinating rabbit holes about people, companies and industries. I plan to share some of these stories and insights through these mini episodes. I hope you enjoy them. Here we go. Few Indians have heard of Hindustan Unilever Limited, HUL, but they are intimate with the brands it sells. To name a few, Lifebuoy, Dove, Clinic Plus, Ponds, Lakme, Closeup, Surf XL, Vim, Brookbond, Brew, Quality Walls, Kisan, and as of 2020, Holix. Nine out of ten Indian households use an HUL product every month. Forget Google and Facebook. More Indians use HUL products than those who own a television, those who vote or even those who have running water or electricity. Even if you don't know much about Hindustan Unilever, you have grown up with it and you are touching it every single day of your life, just like your parents, grandparents and their grandparents. While researching for this book, I came across a faded copy of the first annual report of the newly incorporated Hindustan Lever in 1958. The company was already among the largest in the country and made a profit after tax of 1 crore, roughly 10 million US dollars. In 2019, the company made a profit of 6,080 crore, a compound annual growth of 15%. In the same period that HUL grew its profit 6,000 times, the Indian economy grew 1,400 times. It is hard to find another large company that has delivered 15% earnings growth over 60 years anywhere in the world. It is nearly impossible to find one that has stayed in the top five of a large country over 60 years. Apart from being omnipresent in our lives and being at the top of the business game for a very long time, HUL is an immensely influential company. For the last decade, HUL has been ranked by AC Nielsen as a dream employer of choice in the top 20 business schools in India. HUL is taken extremely seriously in government circles with many of its past chairmen being Padma Bhushan and Padma Vibhushan awardees. These are coveted civilian awards given by the government of India. Most famously, nobody gives more CEOs to corporate India than HUL. From Nestle to Diageo to Airtel to Hindalgo to DMAD to Raymond to the Star Network, there are currently around 400 HUL alumni who are CEOs, CXOs across corporate India. In corporate circles, HUL is well known by the nickname the CEO factory. Because of the influence of its alumni, many business practices in corporate India have their origin HUL. This is obviously the case in sales, marketing and HR, but also exists in finance, supply chain, R&D and legal. These are the opening paragraphs of the book, The CEO Factory, Management Lessons from Hindustan Unilever by Sudhir Sitapati, who joined HUL in 1999 and was the executive director of Foods and Refreshment when this book was published. Today, he is the managing director and CEO of Godrej Consumer Products. The CEO Factory is a handbook of counter-intuitive management insights for everyone. The book covers HUL's 100 plus years of history in India and management lessons in marketing, product, pricing, sales, cost management, HR and company values. I will share and read out some of my highlights from the book, though I highly recommend everybody to read this book. Birth and Growth of HUL William Lever introduced Indians to the joy of sunlight and life boy as early as 1888. To meet, as he characteristically put it, the washing needs of the teeming millions of India. The precursor companies to HUL, Hindustan Vanaspati Manufacturing and Lever Brothers, were incorporated in the early 1930s. Both were owned by Unilever, though Hindustan Lever United, as HUL was formerly known, was formed by their merger only in 1956. So in a sense, the real history of HUL in India is over 125 years old. The history of HUL can broadly be broken up into three phases. A phase of market development followed by managing in a highly regulated environment and then competing in an open economy. Each of the three phases has added to the genetic makeup of HUL, from the importance of category development to being resilient and innovative in times of extraordinary difficulty to becoming an even more consumer-focused company. Let's take an example. Lipton and Brookbond, both part of HUL today, responded to Viceroy Lord 
Cruzon's Clarion called to develop the domestic D market in order to find an outlet for the excess tea production that was taking place in Assam. Tea, a quintessentially British drink, was treated with suspicion in India. It was considered an addiction and something that weakened you. This led to the creation of Indian chai, high in milk and sugar content that was sold to the consumer as a nutritious drink. The invention of chai is just one example of HUL's core management principle developing new categories. Middle class management, the HUL way. In 2018, our chairman of 13 years, Harish Manwani, stepped down. Harish had spent close to 40 years in the Unilever system, rising to becoming global chief operating officer. It was the highest an HUL person had risen. Harish had double-hatted as non-executive chairman of HUL while fulfilling his global responsibilities. He was now finally retiring from the company he loved. In one of the gatherings, Harish spoke about how unique a company HUL was. What he asked was its secret sauce. He gave four answers. A middle-class soul, a meritocratic culture, managers who are equally comfortable in dusty Indian villages as they are in London or Rotterdam, and finally, unchanging core values. A middle-class soul. HUL has managed to keep a culture that is quintessentially Indian middle-class, hardworking, frugal, aspiring and humble. I recall travelling with Harish to Delhi when he was COO of Unilever and the keynote speaker at AdAsia, a big advertising industry conference. He refused to put up in a suit at the Taj and instead two of us stayed in a comfortable but sober company guesthouse in Vasan Vihar. When I joined the company, fresh from IIM Ahmedabad, I became a sales manager and would travel across Madhya Pradesh in 38 degree heat. I was not entitled to an AC car. The reasoning was, if the company's salespeople were expected to make 40 sales calls in searing heat, it would be most unbecoming for the manager to look cool and well turned out when he or she entered the market. Why marketing is business? Marketing lessons from Hindustan Unilever. Marketing is the nodal function that sits at the heart of the business. It frames business problems in consumer terms, understands unmet consumer needs, and then mobilizes the rest of the company into fulfilling it. You could also call marketing at HUL, the Department of Meeting Consumer Needs, which is what the whole company is supposed to be doing. In HUL, marketing is the business. What is a brand? Is as tricky a question as what is marketing? I like to think of brands as trust marks that have a few specific associations for many consumers. Marking A on a bag of wheat is a mark, but it is a trust mark when many people trust that A on the bag of wheat means it is good quality wheat. Ask consumers to close their eyes and say what comes to mind about the brand Lifebuoy. Chances are they will say soap, red, germ kill, rectangular, doctor, strong smelling. Think of your favorite brands and repeat the exercise. You will be able to form very sharp associations that several people share. Consumers pay a significant premium for the simplicity in navigation that a good brand can bring. And unlike product quality or good pricing or easy availability, building brands mainly requires intellectual capital. It is easily the best return on investment in most businesses. At HUL, marketing is a function that understands and solves consumer needs using brands. It is easier to grow a category than it is to grow a brand. This is because an underpenetrated category represents an unsolved consumer problem, while growing brand penetration in an already penetrated category means nudging out a competitor who has more or less solved the problem. Of course, one should attempt to grow a category only if one is the market leader. Otherwise, the fruits of your labor will land in the lap of a competitor. It is much better to target non-users and light users because heavy users of a category or a brand know it so well that they are difficult to influence any further. Finally, increasing numbers of users is much easier than increasing frequency of usage. In summary, it is easiest to get non-users of a category to adopt the category and it is toughest to get heavy users of a brand to consume more of it. A lot of the evidence from this argument can be found in the brilliant book How Brands Grow by Baron Sharp. Do segmenting and targeting work? In any category, or for that matter in any behavior, most human beings tend to want the same thing and behave in a surprisingly similar manner. For instance, a report during the heyday of the TV serial, Kyunki Saas Bhi Kabhi Bahuthi, said that for every demographic, income, town, class and geography, the soap was number one in terms of rating. Purnima from Pedder wrote, 
spent her leisure time the same way as Geeta from Gorakhpur. Before understanding how to position, it is important to understand why to position a brand. Plenty of evidence suggests that the biggest factor that drives purchase of brands in a category is salience. If you are the most remembered brand in a category, chances are that you are also the most bought. Most of marketing is about being salient. But to be salient, you need to have a few rich associations. This is where positioning comes in. There is a tendency in all of us to do more rather than to do better. More rarely works. What is an insight? An insight is a contradiction that is obvious in hindsight. One of my favorite insights is one that I saw several years ago on HUL's most controversial brand, Fair and Lovely. The insight was, my gene pool is my destiny. I was dumbstruck. In six words, the brand had captured the entire history of India. Its cultural and political schism, and without using the word, had put fair skin at the heart of it. Another brilliant one was the detergent brand Rin, which was, unfair as it may seem, appearances can open and shut doors. Another recent insight I framed was, those with money are thrifty, those without splurge. I was perplexed by a poor family I had met in Pune who had just splurged the previous night on a Magnum ice cream. The next family I met, which was much more middle class, never bought the Magnum but bought the regular Chocobar quite often. Be famous before being persuasive. Advertising and media lessons from Hindustan Unilever. Branding is not whether consumers recognize the brand logo, quite the opposite. Good branding is being able to recognize the brand in the absence of the logo. Media planning, whispering to many is better than shouting to a few. Reach more people a fewer number of times than reach fewer people more times or more impactfully. For instance, for many years on Conetto Ice Cream, we defined the target group as teenagers when actually it was being consumed by everyone from ages 6 to 80. Yes, teenagers were consuming about 20% more than others. But our ultra-sharp targeting meant we were spending 4 to 5 times more money on reaching a teenager when the benefits was just a little more. Most messages are relevant to almost everyone. Whisper to everybody rather than shout to a chosen few. Get the product right and the brand will follow. Product Development Lessons from Hindustan Unilever Understanding Consumer Needs While penetration is usually driven by awareness and distribution, consumption is driven by price and product quality. Great pieces of consumer understanding can come from strange places. A while ago, I was reading Early Indians by Tony Joseph. The book uses the latest genetic evidence to piece together who our ancestors were. Joseph talks about a gene mutation called 13910T which originated in Europe about 7,500 years ago, which allows humans to digest lactose present in milk. Large population swaths of North and West India have this mutation gene, while equally large number in the East and South don't have this gene and are hence lactose intolerant. He makes a further argument that since people in North and West get their protein through milk, they tend to be vegetarian, and those in South and East tend to be non-vegetarian. Suddenly, Several puzzles on the eating habits of people in the subcontinent were clear in my mind. A few weeks earlier, I visited a village near Coimbatore and been surprised by the quantity and the variety of meat in the diet of women there. Apart from chicken and fish, goat liver, partridge and quill were being consumed frequently. Contrast this with my visit in early 2019 to Carnivorous, Pakistan, where a farmer near Multan told me their diet was predominantly vegetarian with meat due to its high price being served once a week. I understood why the quality of tea sold in Punjab was poor. They merely needed a color addition to thick milk. Why Bengalis use deserts made of chena, cottage cheese, it has much less lactose. Why Gujaratis eat so much ice cream made from dairy fat, while the Assamis prefer vegetable fat for theirs. Great product insights come from everywhere. You just need to have curious mind and the ability to make connections. Persist patiently. Product breakthroughs happen much slower than commonly believed. In 100 years of the detergent powder industry, there has been no more than three or four significant product breakthroughs. Once you're onto a product idea, you must be extremely patient in seeing it through. The Art and Science of Pricing Pricing Lessons from Hindustan Unilever Price discounts do not recruit new consumers. First, let us look at how not to price. 
the biggest myth in pricing practiced by most e-commerce companies is to price at a discount, recruit consumers, and then take up the price. Windy, former HUL chairman, took a very different view and is reported to have said, the gross margin a brand is born with is the gross margin that it dies with. New users adopt a brand for three reasons. Access, awareness, and availability. The amount they consume has to do with their satisfaction with product quality and price. Lowering and increasing price changes consumption and not the recruitment of new users. Why sales is not a revenue function? Sales management lessons from Hindustan Unilever. Our sales director, Sri Nandan Sundaram Tan, gave me this brilliant insight. Sales is a cost center and not a revenue center. Once you are clear on this, everything else about managing a sales and distribution system is easy. What Tan was saying was that brands and not the sales function generates sales. The job of a sales system is to fulfill demand in the lowest cost possible. Pipes don't quench thirst, water does. Roads don't take you to a destination you desire to go does. Roads and pipes, like the sales system, are mere enablers. Sales teams shouldn't be rewarded for bringing in revenue. Instead, they should be rewarded for creating the enablers of revenue. Respect for money, cost management lessons from Hindustan Unilever. Harish Manwani had the ability to synthesize complex thoughts into pithy one-liners. One of his favorite was, fix the price and the profit you want to make, the cost is the target you have to achieve. The most important reason Harish's formula works is that the price is the biggest driver of volumes and volumes are the biggest driver of cost reduction. By fixing prices low, drive volumes up and cost down. Throwing toddlers in the deep end. HR lessons from Hindustan Unilever. HUL measures caliber using three criteria, judgment, drive and influence. Judgment is the ability to take the right decisions. Drive is the ability and desire to get things done. Influence is getting the world to see your point of view. There you have it. If you have come this far, you have been listening to bits and pieces of Hindustan Unilever Limited's establishment and contribution towards the Indian consumers and corporate culture. The book is full of anecdotes and counterintuitive insights. I highly recommend everybody to read it because each page will make you stop and rethink your concepts of management, culture, and values. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone who will find it valuable. I wish there are similar books on Indian companies and leaders that I can read and create mini-series on. If you have any feedback or recommendations, drop me a line at pritish at the rate 1%.live. Until next time.